Greetings, fellow investors. I'm Matthew Cochran, a lead advisor at Seven Investing, where it is our mission to empower you to invest in your future. We do that by providing monthly stock recommendations to our premium members and educational content that is freely available to everyone. Listeners, today I am very excited to welcome back Alex, perhaps better known by his pseudonym, The Science of Hitting. This is his second time on the show. Uh, he was an investment columnist for Guru Focus for most of the past nine years, where he wrote more than 800 articles. He's uh, one of the most informative followers on FinTwit, and he hosts the Science of Hitting podcast on major podcast players everywhere. And I said was, because Alex, you're not writing for Guru Focus anymore. You're starting a new Substack. So why don't you tell everyone what you're planning and, and what inspired the change? Yeah, well, thanks for having me again. We had a great discussion last time, so I look forward to this one. Of course, um, Absolutely. In a nutshell, I decided to move the Substack because I thought it was a good chance to kind of go direct and, and get closer with the audience and, you know, make sure the incentives were properly aligned in a lot of ways so I could focus on kind of the quality of the work as opposed to the quantity of the work, which I think got a little bit out of balance in some, in some ways, not anybody's fault, but that's just kind of how it evolved. So I thought this was a great opportunity to focus on the quality of the work. And I also thought it was a chance for me to really go deeper and open up my process more. So the idea of the service is I'm essentially offering complete access to my research process and decision making. So that goes all the way from when I look at new ideas, I'll present them to subscribers. When I have updates on names that I currently own or thoughts that are on things that are happening in their business, I'll obviously, obviously talk about that with subscribers. And then anytime I place trades, I'll have an explanation for the buy decision, the sell decision, and I'll tell people about that before I do it. So most likely day of, obviously. Um, so just really opening everything up. And, you know, I, I think in some ways, obviously being open will invite feedback. And my goal would be to become a better investor myself, obviously, but also to, to help people along their own journey of becoming a better investor. So I, I think it's a really good chance for me to just be more direct with an audience that uh, views my work as high quality. So hopefully I can find those people and I, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, so we, we kind of listeners, if you're, if you didn't hear the first episode, we kind of, uh, tackled, uh, Alex's like thought process and investment philosophy philosophy in that episode. But Alex, like, uh, why don't you just tell us like, I mean, like, uh, you're as part of your investment process, like, like, how do you, do you like build out financial models? Like, like what, uh, like, how do you, do you, do you entail that in your process at all? Yeah. So the, the first big paid post of the service is a complete portfolio review. And I go through everything that I currently own and obviously talk about the business. I talk about valuation and for a fair number of the names, I have models for some of them. I don't, but for a large number I do. And one of the early articles in the service is going to be about financial modeling. Basically, you know, there's some, some people in the camp that the most they would ever do is a kind of a backup of the envelope calculation. And for other people, they have an Excel spreadsheet with 12 tabs and a thousand interconnecting cells. And, you know, it can get uh, very precise and very intense. So, you know, I'm, I'm somewhere in the middle of the road. I think about modeling in the sense of trying to get to a rough estimate of where earnings power, free cash flow can be, you know, call it five years down the road. And that output's important, but I don't think it's the, the sole purpose. I think the, the bigger rationale for doing it is to get a good understanding of the drivers of that outcome and to think about things like if it's a retailer, well, what does unit growth mean, for example? What kind of capital requirements come with unit growth? What about comps growth? What kind of capital requirements come with comps growth? How much of this story is tied to you know, repurchases or, or dividends? So capital returns to shareholders. So it's thinking about those things and trying to really get an understanding for where the thesis will be made or broken, essentially. Sure. No, I, I actually, uh, like, I agree with you. Like, uh, that's, that's what I use, like, models for, too, is to just try to find, like, what's moving, like, the business and what can move returns there. Just trying to find, like, the, the biggest factors into it. Uh, like, uh, you know, I, I tried, like, modeling for a little bit, like, where I would try to be real detailed. And I just basically, like, gave up in uh, exasperation because I, I never knew how what to put in for the terminal value. I never knew, like, you know, there's just so many things I just – I'm like, how am I supposed, how do you guess at this? You know, you can play with a few things and, and basically get whatever output you want. So, uh, but yeah, sure. I do agree with you that like, uh, 
like for, for finding just what moves a business, like it, it can be a really useful tool. That's one of the great, uh, one of the great modeling quotes, which I stumbled across when I was writing the article, I ended up taking it out, but I, I can't remember who said it now. I'm forgetting, sorry, whoever said it, but they say the joke is DCFs are like the Hubble telescope. You move it a fraction of an inch and you're in a different universe. <laughs> <laughs> so there's definitely a That's truth to good. that. You can't become, you can't yeah. become too too obsessed with the the outputs. I think it's thinking reasonably and intelligently about the inputs and the outputs and what it all means. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, obviously the market's been volatile, the, I mean, the last year, but like also the last month. Um, you know, it's like we're right now, I think we're having this like tug of war between like reopening plays and like these high flying tech names. And it's like, you know, it almost like os oscillates like what day it is, like what's in favor and what's out of favor. Um, like how, how do you, how, how do you, what's your view of the market right now? You think that are the tech stocks overvalued Are the, the reopening plays like the airlines and hotels and travel, like, are, do you think mm -hmm. they're overvalued? Like what's your, so what's your take on the market right now? Yeah, I'll start with the typical disclaimer that day to day, week to week, month to month, even year to year, I don't really have any thoughts on, you know, what the market's going to do in the short term. And it's, it's something I really don't even focus on. I'm trying to find high quality businesses that I can own for the long term that will deliver reasonable returns. But up to your point, I think it's been kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I can see, I can see both sides of the argument that both are I don't know if overvalued is the right word, but that certainly optimism has returned. Um, you know, on the on the high flying tech stocks, I posted a chart a day or two ago that showed this the price to sales multiple for SaaS companies as a whole. And the multiple had peaked at, I think it was 13 times and had pulled back to 10 times. And the point of the chart was simply that sure it's pulled back pretty pretty good, but you know, they peaked at eight or nine times early on during COVID. And the response I got from some people was, well, these are better businesses now. They're more established. Digitization has kind of accelerated. And, and I get all that. My kind of response is, well, even to the extent you're true, you, you got another turn or two on the sales multiple. So you did get some benefit in terms of valuation. The market apparently agrees with you somewhat. At the same time, I look at data from Goldman as an example. They say for this group as a whole, FY21 sales estimates are basically unchanged. So it, it, it's not showing up in the very near-term sales data, which you know in some ways makes me question if that thesis is, is supported by the data. So I'm a bit torn on the high-flying tech names, at least as a group. Um, but the same can be said for a lot of the reopening plays. I mean, I've, you've, I've seen people, and I'm sure you've seen it as well, point to stuff like airlines on price to sales, and it's kind of a similar idea. Um, looking at my own portfolio, I own, I own booking holdings up until a week or two ago or a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's a name that at the start of 2020 traded out like $2,000 a share. 2020, their business was down well over 50%. If you listen to management, they say recovery is going to take years. Uh, the street agrees with that. You're looking at two to three years before you most likely get back to 2019 type, type numbers, at least on a normalized basis. And the stock's at 2,400 today. I mean, it's up 20% from where it traded pre-COVID. Right, um, right. And, you know, they're, they're a big player in Europe, which my sense is, is they're having somewhat more of a difficult time than the United States. Um, and they have, they have things they're investing in, but it's also unproven on a lot of those efforts as well. So I just don't think the stories change that much. I think the time frame for things happening has maybe been pushed out a bit, which to me would suggest it's probably worth a little bit less than it was pre-COVID. I don't think there's some big sustain. I don't think the normalized run rate of the business is higher as a result of COVID, which is kind of what you would need to believe. Um, so, and a similar name, a, a similar name is Yelp, which, you know, went from 35 bucks to, I think it bottomed around 15. and their business got hit very significantly. And today it's, you know, I think it's north of $40 a share now. So they're doing a lot of things behind the scenes that I think could ultimately justify that price. It's not like it's completely outlandish, but the bar has just been raised. We've gone from, you know, pessimism to unbridled optimism very quickly, it seems, at least in terms of valuation. So I'm a little bit confused, but that that's been generally true. For, <laughs> that's been generally true for much of the past one, two, five years. So sure, sure. I don't know. I'll continue to be confused. Yeah, I was just <laughs> I, I know, like the, the 
I mean, I think in, in as far as tech goes, like I, I mean, I think there's uh there's definitely some overvalued names. And then at the same time, like I think some big tech is is fairly reasonable. Like the reopening plays, I struggle to understand. Like I was just looking like right before we came on, like the uh the Jets ETF, which is just basically like uh global airliners, you know, it's uh from pre-COVID, like from January first, twenty twenty. So like a you know a couple of months before COVID hit to to now to today, it's down fifteen percent. Which I mean, granted, they're going to survive, but like they took on one, they took on a lot of high interest debt uh, during the pandemic, and and two, like uh, it's going to be a while before customers really come back um, to those levels. And then like another one I was looking at was the Invesco Dynamic Leisure and Entertainment ETF. And that one's up 3%. And that's like, you know, that has restaurants and like some of those travel names like booking or Airbnb, uh, you know, and, and things like that. It, and it's up 3% from uh, mm -hmm. January, 2020, which I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. It's I, hard I to see. I think, that. I think uh, Tobias Carlisle had a segment on value after hours where he dug into some of the valuations on the airlines. And to me, I think about it a lot from the, uh, from the perspective of, I hear Microsoft talking about Teams and the su success it's having. And I hear obviously Slack talking about similar ideas and individual companies. It was, I don't think it was the most recent quarter. Maybe it was the one before. It was a sea change in my mind in terms of how companies talked about remote work. It was, it was basically complete buy-in that a large percentage of companies are okay with this idea. And I, it's maybe not one for one, but I think you'll see something similar in terms of corporate slash business travel, which is a significant part of the market. So something like airlines is just very difficult for me to get my hands around, which was probably true pre-pandemic as well. So I guess I'm okay. I'll just keep avoiding them. <laughs> sure, sure. So do you think, I mean, how do you see business travel in the years ahead? I mean, do you think it's it's like, do you think it's coming back? Do you think conferences and things like that are, are going to still happen or is it going to be moving online or a mix? Like, how do you, how do you see that playing out? It's kind of like my thoughts on booking, which is I'm not entirely sure, but if 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 part of what I need to believe is that it it returns to the run rate it was at previously or even higher, then it becomes a really tough sell for me. And obviously, yeah. there's a need for some amount of business travel to sit with clients and conferences have a purpose and stuff like that. But we've all become very comfortable with Zoom calls. And, and as we can see right here, the technology is very good. Um you know, we'll see what happens with stuff like AR, VR. We'll see what happens with things like driverless cars over a longer period of time. But those are the kind of things that can take away from a relatively short flight that you used to take. You know, it's, I just think there's a lot of ways for the volumes to take a hit, which may or may not impact the business's profitability. I'm not too sure about how the airlines would respond, but it could be an, it could have an impact on volumes. I, I would bet more likely than not that the volumes do not return to the trend that existed prior to the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it will eventually come back, but I think it's going to be a while. But, um, but you know, like, um, you know, my experience, a lot of business conferences are more for the networking, let's say, or the, the socializing after the conferences, you know, sure. into the night and things like that. So I... I you know, I, and as long as like, if there's a sales organization like or a company hosting it for like, you know, it's, so it's being sponsored. So, um, you know, it's not always on the, the people going to it. it's like, at least not the whole thing. It's on their dime. Like, I don't know, I, I do. I do think a lot of those things will come back. But to your point, I mean, like, it's so easy and cheap now to host something like a lot of training and stuff like that, maybe like, I, I do think a lot of that's going to be, you know, it's just going to be virtual now, like, it's so cheap. Like right. why right. host a huge conference, but. There was a Wall Street Journal, Journal article about this that suggested that stuff like training is a fairly significant portion of the market. And again, my idea in all this would be, and I, I can't speak on airlines specifically just because I don't have the knowledge, but the idea in my mind would be if volumes go down even five, 10%, percent let's, let's say, it's the supply and demand uh, dynamics of that industry. If this, you know, 5% of the planes didn't necessarily go away you know, that concept, it could have changes in competitive dynamics that just change the industry landscape. So it's those type of things that would, that really worry me more than just some small decline of demand. I think, and you're seeing an example might be Vail Resorts, which just announced, you know, it could be an offensive move. So I'm not saying it's defensive, but they announced a 20% cut in the price of their 
basically across the board, they're at their passes. And surely some of that is a reflection of the fact that people who previously would have just shelled out the money for the season pass, if you live in somewhere like New York or Boston, where you've been locked inside for a year, you're surely thinking about whether or not you're actually going to get value from that purchase. <laughs> so these, these things matter and competitors will have a response and what you do may ultimately lead, lead to things that are ultimately not in your best interest as a company. Sure. Sure. So let, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about Vail Resort, Vail Resorts uh, for a little bit, if you don't mind. So like, if, if you don't know, like Vail Resorts, they own uh, multiple like skiing resorts around the country, around the world. Um, but like some of the best locations, and uh, like in like what Alex just said, like they just recently cut their like season passes, which is like their main, their big money maker, right? By 20%. Do you think that's offense or defense? Is that a move to like really hurt the competitors while they're down? Or is this like uh, a reactionary move to consumer demand? Let me give you an unsatisfying answer, which is <laughs> I, don't, I don't know because I've just started looking, but gotcha. I, think, I think it's a very interesting industry. There's a good book called yeah. Ski Inc. 2020, which my friend Ernest recommended to me. I just started it, but it's already, I know a book's good if in the introduction, I take notes when I read everything or else I'll forget. I just got through the introduction and I already have three quarters of a page worth of notes. So <laughs> I know this is going to be a good book. Um, sure, sure. But my read on the situation was that for many, as you, as you alluded to, they have they have six of the top 10 mountains in North America based on uh, annual attendance. And my read, I, I go skiing about once a year with friends and we go to Breckenridge and it's one of the premier places to ride. And my sense as someone who has gone for a couple of years was that they consistently increase prices by a pretty fair amount. Um, that was just anecdotal, but now you can go back and look on the Epic Passes, they've increased prices roughly 5% a year since you know, 2012 or so. So for a long time, they took larger than inflation sized increases in the cost of the pass. And it was still a fantastic value because they've been adding mountains the whole way. But yeah, so now they've decided to take a 20% price cut and people are uh, speak very well of the CEO. He seems to be a very smart guy. He's been there for a while. He has a long-term time horizon. So I won't question their conclusion until I know better. Um, at the same time, I, I, I posted a, t a quote from Pat Dorsey, an investor, when he spoke at Google, who said, you know, when a company increases their prices two, three, four percent a year for a long time, and then they suddenly cut them and say, you know, we're, we're being good to our customers. This is a tough time <laughs> in the economy. His response was, that's always bullshit. And I think there's some truth to that as well. They have a competitor with Icon Pass and, you know, they're going to have to they're almost certainly going to have to respond as well. So I don't know. I don't, from my not too knowledgeable position right now, I'd say it's somewhere in the gray. It's not black or white. Sure, sure. Now it's an interesting move. And I just, I, I don't know what to make of it either, I guess. Like, um, you know, the, the number of skiers in, in the US, at least, I don't know if it's global, but like, you know, it, it's it's slowly, but but steadily declined over, you know, the past like several years, like, um, you know, the last two winters, like my, I've taken my family skiing and we don't go to the, like Vail resorts because we just try to like, you know, we live in South Florida. So my kids are just excited to see snow. So if they see a hill with snow on it, they think it's great. So they don't know the difference. So right. we just go to like, we just try to find like an off, like, you know, like an off resort. We don't need to go to the best one. Again, they don't know. So I'm like, if they don't know, you know, like we, we don't need to go there. So we just try to find the cheaper uh, option to wherever we're traveling, but uh, yeah, it's, and it's and it's interesting. Like, are they trying to get like young people interested in the skiing? Like, is it a dying like leisure activity? Is it uh, a way to kick competitors while they're down, or is it like you know, is there you know, are they really hurting to get people back? It's, it's just a it, it, it's an interesting question. An important note on it too, which which is confusing for me. They Epic Pass covers everything from. They're all you can eat pass at the top, which is for all their mountains and basically unlimited riding at those mountains. Then they also have Epic Passes, which are local for a certain set of mountains, all you can ride. But Epic Pass also includes people like myself or like you would be who are just uh, prepaying for one, two, three, four, seven days on the mountain. So it covers everything sure. that's not that's not purchased at the time you're riding. And they cut prices for all of that stuff by 20%. So this is, I don't know how someone can really argue that this is just an attempt to put, not saying that you were, but someone right, couldn't sure. really argue that this is an attempt to push people to the all you can eat pass. And at the same time, mm -hmm. 
if they're saying, well, you were on the local pass, now you'll consider the all-you-can-eat pass. I just don't know how many people's use cases for this product is dependent on the, dependent on the pricing of one bucket versus the other. If you live in Colorado and all you want to do is ride at Breck and at Beaver Creek or wherever else, I don't really know if there's an incentive there to pay up anyways, even if it is you know, basically the same price as you used to pay. And same for if you were going to go for three days, maybe this convinces you to go for, I don't know, but we'll have to see what the results are. And, um, but yeah, I've talked to a number of people who like the stock who thought it was a smart move. I don't know if they, I don't know if I had told them a month ago that that veil was going to cut the price to 20% that they'd be as optimistic, but right, sure, again, sure. we'll see what happens. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, for sure. Uh, we'll have to, next time we talk, we'll, let's follow up on that. All right. Um, let's move on to uh, some retailers and um, actually a group of retailers. I think we both generally like, um, I actually don't own any of them, but like, I, I don't have anything bad to say about them either. And like, it's the discount retailers like five below or Ollie's or Dollar Tree or even Dollar General. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, like you, I don't own any of them. So I'm glad we've, we've wasted our time together equally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been close a few times. It probably would have Ollie's is, Ollie's, Ollie's is the one that hurt me the most. I got really close to buying when it got down to about 35 or 40 and then it took a, then it had a really big run, but uh, that's water under the bridge now. So yeah. That, I, I, that was my, of my biggest re regret of like, as far as like uh, investing in the pandemic was that I somehow missed Ollie's because I had been following it for a while. I was waiting for I none of my wildest dreams that I think it would get as far as low as it did. I was hoping mm -hmm. for like the fifties, you know, maybe low sixties even. And, uh, and I totally just missed it. I, there was, I guess there's too much going on. I don't know. It just, uh, it flew under my radar. It just didn't register. Yeah. I think there was, I, I don't even know if I looked at it at that time. There was just right. so much, it was just so much going on, but yeah, always is a concept for people who live in the U S that, if there's one 20 miles out of your way and you're on a road trip or something, you have to go see it. It's a, it's a retail experience of like any others. Uh, and I say that in a good and a bad way. <laughs> yes, um, it's, it's, it's both of that is true. Um, yeah. But generally speaking, I just, I think the space is interesting for a number of reasons and dollar general is probably the best example. It's a, it's, it's store footprint. It's, it's unique. It's, it's doesn't have a ton of, uh, I guess you would call, you know, large competitors. Um, you know, the, the trips are frequent, tend to be low, low ticket. So it's something that's really hard to compete with e-commerce. It, it's a lot of um, convenience purchases. It's something that someone's buying, you know, they might be stopping home on the way from work to buy a frozen pizza and some chips or something, some laundry detergent, but they need it that night. It's not, this is stuff that in my mind, even if you could be price competitive, it, it's just not really stuff that's going to be competed away by e-commerce. So I, I really like the cat category generally. Um, and the problem as always is, is thinking about valuations and for something like Dollar General as well, I, I kind of struggle with the long-term opportunity on store count because they have added a ton of stores in the past 10 years and they're trying new concepts and trying to find a, finding ways to, to get into newer, newer markets. But it, it's tough when you're putting up, you know, a thousand boxes a year. So something like Costco, I, I still like a lot. I feel like the e-commerce risk there is a little bit higher, but they're so early on the international strategy and they've had success um, and they've always taken a slower pace to unit growth. So you could, I think you could legitimately make the case there that if the model continues to work, which I think it will, you're looking at a decades long runway of unit growth. So sure. um, I think there's some really interesting concepts in the space and I don't think prices in general are that crazy. I probably need to, update some numbers but as of right now i don't i don't own anything in that space right like so um like i actually divide those like the discount retailers into two separate categories like so i would have like dollar general maybe even like walmart you know like to me like dollar general like they just if you live in the suburbs or the city like i would i would i would understand like why you why you think like well i don't understand what's so special about this store but like when you go into the country so like my parents used to live in the sticks in south carolina and when we'd go visit them to go to a Walmart or any major grocery store would be a 20 minute drive easy. Um, and the Dollar General was like a maybe at tops two minutes away, you know? So if they needed any basic item, you know, um, they're going to Dollar General. They're not driving 20 minutes to buy some milk or some eggs or, um, 
or whatever, you know, like um, if they're having people over like, you know, some soda or beer or, or, you know, just basic items like that. You're not going 20 minutes for, to pick up a couple items. You're just going to drive two minutes and you're, you'll pay a little more than you Mm -hmm. might've at a major grocery store, but it's not enough to even come close to justifying driving all that extra way. Um, And then, you know, and and they're all over. Like when you're, when you're in small town America, like dollar generals are are where it's at, you know, sometimes there's, there's two in each small town, like one on each side. I mean, they just, you know, and in the country, like everything just spread out so much. Um, Yeah. There's a, uh, I love some of, you know, every once in a while, a a Bloomberg or a Wall Street Journal will have these great like company profile type articles. I'm thinking of the one, there's a Bloomberg article about Chipotle. It's like the definitive history where they interview a bunch of people from Els, who was the founder to people at McDonald's who were involved when they bought them. So anyways, it's, it's just a great article, but there's one from the Wall Street Journal that's about Dollar General. And my favorite quote from the article was the former CEO from, I think it was like 2003 to 2008 or something. And his quote was, we go where they ain't. And he was referring to Walmart. (laughs) They would literally just look where Walmarts were and throw stores. As you said, like if we can put a store near a town of five, 10,000 people and have the closest Walmart be 20 miles away, we know that's a winning strategy. And it's one they've, they've played very, very well over the last decade. The story is fascinating. So I actually read the book by the, um, Mm. I guess the son of the founder. Um, But like, uh, you know, just like, uh, you know, just, so his dad was just, just this great entrepreneur, but like, he just had, he was, he was great at like selling things and like, you know, knowing like kind of like reading, just having a great intuition about what people wanted and especially his audience, you know, they knew, I mean, started, I think in Kentucky, uh, either Tennessee or Kentucky, but like, uh, you mm-hmm. know, small towns, like where, you know, people, you know, are not making much. And like one of their like first promotional strategies was to like give out free, uh, free uh, farmer gloves. They would go around to all the farms, like, and they would like send out a flyer and like, it would have one free glove, like I, I left hand or right hand, I forget. It said to get the other glove, come in, it's free, you know, but they <laughs> knew like, if they come into the store, they would b- buy things, you know? So, um, it's a great um, idea. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. But like, he had no organization. So like they eventually they would just grow. And then like, they would got to this point, like, you know, where they're like, the father would come in and he would like estimate how much is in the warehouse and like say like, you know, and, and put it down for their numbers, you know, and it was just like, uh, it, it was just funny. So when they went public, they had to learn everything. They had no idea how to do like, you know, real calculations, like analysts would ask them questions. And he said, like, I would just like be like a deer in the headlights. I had no idea. So we'd have to go back and like find out like how to do everything. Um, But it was, it's a good story. It's a good story. Interesting. Um, While we're on the topic, I should add this real quick because Dollar Tree is a a name I've talked about a lot. And, you know, the story there has kind of been the the Dollar Tree banner has been a fantastically successful retail concept. Um, But they got in a bidding war for family dollar with, or for family dollar with dollar general. Well, probably five years ago now, I think it was 2015. Um, dollar tree was the the winner, uh, acquirer's curse there. Right. The winner, um, right. <laughs> yeah. it, has, it has not gone well. Uh, family dollar was a beneficiary from the pandemic. Cause when people went to places like Walmart or, you know, a local grocery store and couldn't find cleaning supplies and paper towels, they finally went to family dollar because of that. So we're still going to see whether or not this turnaround actually takes hold. But the the reason why I brought this up is because family or Dollar Tree has spent a lot of time talking about the synergies of having these two banners under one, you know, corporate umbrella. Well, they finally unveiled one of their big synergies, which is a store that essentially split down the middle from the outside. One side is a family dollar banner and one side is a Dollar Tree banner. And people will have to see this to believe it. You can pull it up and see the picture. It's the most God awful, (laughs) ugly looking (laughs) store you've ever seen in your life. Oh man. The idea that this wasn't a joke (laughs) is, is simply unbelievable. But yeah, so I'm still following Dollar Tree, but that picture alone was enough for me to consider um never owning it going forward <laughs> so great. let's see what happens that's great but you know you can't put too much in a store so like we were talking about ollie's um you know and they're just famous for i mean their f- founder mark butler uh before he died you know he was just like i mean to, to say they do not put much effort into the store's appearance is in uh i i think it is very accurate <laughs> yes but you um, only you step in there and you'll know what he you'll you'll know what matt means very quickly <laughs> yes. and at the same time though like people love it 
I mean, but the you know, prices they are fantastic. The prices are fantastic. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to get. So there's that element of like uh, mystery, or I guess they would say like a, a treasure, you know, like a treasure, treasure uh, hunting expedition, like treasure, treasure shopping. But um, yeah, when, when I was researching it, people, there was these articles going around about them having wedding dresses. I don't know if you ever heard about that. No, or, stop it, stop I don't know. It. If it, I don't know if it was a hundred bucks or, <laughs> or 20 bucks. It was one or the other. Well, they had some the last time I went and boy, those dresses, those dresses still looked overpriced. They did not look good. <laughs> but anyways. I can't imagine getting a wedding dress from Ollie's. They weren't, they were not very good looking. Sad to say. <laughs> My brother-in-law worked at Walmart for a spell. Uh, and when his, when my niece, his daughter was like very young and like, uh, like at some point it came up, like, like she was asking my sister, like her mom, like how, uh, like how getting married works and wedding rings and things like that. And she's like, Oh, when you fall in love with someone, when you're older, you can marry them. And she's like, maybe he'll get my wedding ring at Walmart. <laughs> you know, you that go. was like the, <laughs> <laughs> like in, in her like four or five year old eyes, that was like the pinnacle of, of shopping. Right. <laughs> that's funny um so okay so uh, like another thing in the news like uh you know uh like spotify like i know you follow them and they bought locker room like mm -hmm. uh you know like i guess it's, it's just a competitor to clubhouse like what's uh what's the rationale here yeah i would assume it is i think you know ben thompson wrote about this uh i think it was yesterday and that's that's who i turned to to understand a lot of the strategy slash, sure. slash tech of all this stuff um, and I think what he wrote makes a lot of sense. I think it's, you know, it was, a, it was a relatively cheap deal in the grand scheme of things. And they paid 50 million, according to the wall street journal payouts could be 80 million if they hit certain targets, obviously, I think it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting new form of audio. And as Ben Thompson kind of alluded to from Spotify's perspective, it's, it's important that creators are on their platforms, whatever that means, you know, whether it's uh, anchor or, now locker room um it's important to have creators and importantly i think spotify is in a very good position given the the real estate they own on people's phones and it's a place where people naturally go to listen to audio so if they have a compelling you know joe rogan uh live i don't even know what we call it live audio live, live podcast if they have something right. like that sure. or if the ringer does for sporting events which would seem like a natural fit here you know it's it's one of the things they can do to try to try to really complete that vision he had i think he said this is kind of the espn of the future is one of the comments he made when they bought ringer or could be as successful and i think that's kind of an interesting idea to think about what they can do in sports in something like the audio space so i think it's a you know in the scheme of spotify's balance sheet income statement market cap it's a it's a small bet if the whole space never goes anywhere, you threw away $50 million, but you, you took care of a kind of an potentially an existential risk, who knows? Um, so I don't think there's any way it can really be a huge miss. On the other hand, if it becomes a hugely popular space, I think it's important for them to have a presence. So I, I think generally speaking, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with a lot of the moves they've made. I'm reading the Spotify book right now, which was written by these two Swedish guys, and they got it translated to English. It's a fantastic read. It's called Spotify Play. People should read it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've been impressed by what Spotify has been doing. And growing subs is one thing. You know, I, I think relatively big news that happened recently that didn't get a ton of press coverage was Spotify launched a product in South Korea and one of the major record labels in South Korea also owns something called Melon, which is a basically a Spotify competitor in South Korea. So as Spotify was launching in that market, they had a disagreement about keeping that record label's music on Spotify. And the reporting from, I think it was Variety or the Wall Street Journal here in the last uh, two or three weeks was that there was a ton of backlash from artists and fans. And most of the backlash was actually on the label. It wasn't on Spotify from what I saw. And the article specifically said that they came to the table and settled at the terms that were initially being discussed. Spotify didn't, didn't give up anything incremental. So I think, I think my view on this space and what's going on is, is, is changing slightly. And I think Spotify is probably in a good position to, to take chances, but also to continue to try to, you know, really, really, win in audio i mean you can see the potential for something like this right like uh going back to locker room just how like 
right after a playoff game ends and you have a sports podcast. I mean, like one thing sports podcasts can't really do is like just start airing as soon as a game ends, you know, with your after game take or like, you know, for the, in the financial world, like after Apple reports earnings or, or something like that, you know, if there's big news, mm-hmm. like how, you know, instead of like waiting for your next podcast to drop or wh- whenever that is, you could go live right away and people could listen. So I see the potential. Um, you were talking about like Spotify a little, I mean, they're up to 345 million uh, active users, 155 million uh, subscribers. Their revenue growth, I think, was like 17% in the last quarter. They're starting to show some free cash flow. Is this is this like um like is the ship finally turning here for them to like make like real profits or like are the economics of the industry changing? My answer at this point is I don't know. Um, I one of the things and it'll probably be part of the service i presume depending on if i work with other people and how how they feel about that but one of the things i really want to work on which i've struggled to find this this book gives some crumbs in terms of how the deals were originally structured i'd really like to go back and look at how this has all evolved over the past 10 years and try to put numbers on it directly as possible um i don't know if it's actually possible given the disclosures that have been made either in filings or you know in in press releases and the like but I'd really like to go back and get a sense for that because it seems logical that as we keep going down this road, um, Spotify is going to be in a very strong position in individual markets globally on a couple different dimensions where when they go and sit down in a room with someone, it's one thing to write them off when they have 20 million subs or 100 million subs, but now you're, you're up at 350 million monthly actives. And it seems like it's, it's a lot of people, way. a lot of listeners, it's, it's a lot of people, a lot and of a listeners. Lot of, yeah. As some, as someone, my, my route to this kind of investment. And even as a user, I, I signed up for YouTube music one time because they gave me three months for free and I used it for a while. I thought it was a decent product. Then I switched to Spotify and switching over and getting all my music on there. And, you know, the artists that I liked and things like that, it, it wasn't, it took a little bit of work. It wasn't, it wasn't like days of work, but it took work to get that music over there. And now on Spotify, I have playlists and the artists I like and the podcasts I like, et cetera. So I do think there's some reality to the fact that they've built a differentiated product and it shows in the user numbers and it shows in the engagement data. So again, this, this South Korean example, Spotify has a real negotiating position. And I think one of the interesting takeaways from the book is when they were negotiating early on to get into the US, they had a really hard time getting the labels to even come to the table, really, because Apple was such a big source of of revenue from digital, you know, sales of songs for 99 cents. When they eventually got two of the major labels to agree, they essentially sent an email to one of the other big labels and said, listen, we'd love to have you on the service, but we're launching in next week or whenever it is. And if you guys aren't on there, it is what it is. And I thought it was interesting reading that, that, you know, at that time they had, I don't know, 10 million users or something like that. And they were already in a position where they were confident enough to launch a product that wasn't, you know, really complete in a lot of ways. Now you fast forward and they're on their way to 400 million subs and people think about, you know, would they be okay with losing one of the major labels for a period of time? And I, the more I think about it, the more I'm of the position that they probably have the upper hand in a lot of these discussions kind of related uh kind of related was like uh to spotify buying locker room was that like there's at the same time there's rumors going around that microsoft might buy discord uh for 10 billion dollars we talked about microsoft in our last conversation do you have any thoughts about like uh like a possible acquisition there this is a this is one of the positions where it's really nice to be invested in a company where you really trust management and their long term <laughs> vision because I gotta I gotta tell you I'm honestly still confused exactly what Discord is like I don't you know when you play and this is this is just my personal experience when I play on Xbox Live but I had a mic I talk to people on there right so right. gamers gamers today must be doing something different that I don't even know about but apparently Discord is extremely popular but so. Long answer short, I I certainly trust management to make an intelligent long-term decision. I like a lot of the things they're doing in gaming, so it would probably fit in well, but I don't really know what the product is. (laughs) To best of my knowledge, and I actually have a Discord, like um, for, we use it for some things at 7investing, and uh, I'm not on there much, but like, 
it's kind of like Slack, except there's also audio stuff too, and, or okay. like even video too. So I, I almost like, uh, uh, like if, if you imagined like, uh, like Slack or, or Zoom with Slack or Slack, you know, like a Slack Zoom combo, like almost something like that. But that is probably a horribly wrong take and I'm probably <laughs> <laughs> missing things there. But like my, uh, my very loose impression of it is it's something like that. Okay, but, well, I'll do more research on it, especially if they buy it. So next time we talk, I'm going to have a better answer. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm, we're, 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 uh, we, we did a lot of research for this show. <laughs> yeah, well, I almost had to download TikTok and start using it when they were talking about buying that. So I'm really glad that didn't go through. And I'm sure a lot of other TikTok sure. users are happy about that, well, too. I mean, <laughs> you know, we could have seen some of your dance moves, though. So it have all yeah. worked out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> One thing we've talked about every time we talk is about uh, banking and fintech. And like, um, is fintech, like, is, is legacy banking a melting ice cube? Like, is, is fintech eating market share from them? Um, and, you know, since our last discussion, to your credit, uh, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, I mean, they're up like what, about 50%? And that was yeah. in uh, like what, maybe five months ago? Yeah, they've had a good run, which. You know, they also had a terrible run before that. So, um, which Bank of America's worked out well in terms of timing. I, I got lucky in terms of when I started buying it, but Wells has, there's been a lot of pain in front of that train. So it's, uh, it's well, nice that it's, well, there's a, yeah, that's a hard one right there. It's nice that it's done well recently, but it was a couple of years of pain before that. So, but, sure. but yeah, so they've, they've done well lately, which obviously changes the, you know, the thinking in terms of whether or not it's worth being a position at all, whether it's worth being a certain size, et cetera. So that, that's worth saying. I think the other big change in the industry has been, you know, the, the yield curve, the 210 spread, the 210 US Treasury spread bottomed out at like 50 basis points or maybe a little bit below that back in August, I want to say. Um, since then, it's, it's increased quite a bit to, I think it, it was around 160 bips today. So, you know, depending who you ask, because obviously there's assumptions as assets and liabilities reprice, how much will be given to depositors and the like. Um, but the estimates I've seen suggest that a move of that kind, you know, call it 100, 100 basis points in the long end is probably worth 10% plus in terms of net interest income for Wells Fargo and Bank of America, which is, I mean, hugely important. Wells Fargo in particular has gotten crushed on net interest margin and net, net interest income over the past 10 years. So they they would really, really, really like to see some benefit on NIM and NII over the next, you know, couple of years if possible. So that's a bit encouraging. Um, you know, outside of that, I think much of what I've said in the past probably still rings true. These companies are investing a ton of money on tech, you know, both consumer facing and back end. They still have branch networks and ATM networks that even if they're used less often, they do have value from time to time potentially. Um, at the same time, there are a large number of competitors, a large number of tech startups coming at different parts of the business. So, you know, I, I talk about both of these names in depth in, in my portfolio review so people can read more there. But I, I'm, I'm still undecided on where, where I stand in terms of the, the quality of these businesses. Are they high quality enough to be in my portfolio if they're the kind of things I'm going to own for the next 5, 10, 20 years? And forgetting about the stock price for a minute, are the businesses high quality enough? And I think there's a reasonable argument both ways. So nothing's ever black or white in this game, but it's something I continue to think about. Sure, sure. Like, do you have any uh, like a, a thoughts or opinion like on like Square and PayPal, like they're going to offer where people can like fund their purchases soon with like cryptocurrency, like uh, any of their merchants um, or like yesterday, I mean, I, I retweeted this, but like, uh, you know, like Square Cash, Square's Cash App was doing a, a give a, a giveaway with Miley Cyrus on Twitter, who has like uh, approximately like fifty gazillion followers, where she was giving away a million dollars worth of stocks. I think in, divided in fifty dollar segments to like a whole bunch of people. Um, you know, to try to get people like on uh, Cash App to 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 buy and sell stocks. You know, use that function more on the app. But like, um, do you? I mean, are, are these kinds of things, are they going to continue to drive engagement for like Cash App or PayPal and Venmo? Um, you know, like I just, like I, I know, I think we come at like uh, different sides on this one, but like uh, a, a little bit, um, but like, uh, you know, I just, 
like that kind of marketing, it, it's so like, you know, for a million dollars, like, you know, if they get like how many people starting to buy and sell stocks on their platform, you know, with this mm-hmm. like promotional tie in with Miley Cyrus, or if like buying your, you know, buying your groceries in Bitcoin, or, or whatever, going out to a restaurant and buying it in Bitcoin, is that what's, if that's what like makes people use the apps more, I just think that's like such a low customer acquisition cost. No, that's uh, fair. Know, yeah, it's fair. so hard to match. I mean, like I would even chase or Wells Fargo. I would even extend that to something like, you know, think about Robinhood relative to the Fidelities and the Schwabs of the world. Are sure. these they have found a way both organically, but they just have they've had better customer. I don't know if better is the right word. They've had effective customer acquisition tools so far. They're still very young, or at least Robinhood's very young. I'll be curious to see how obviously these things tend to tend to. Uh, reach a younger audience on average i'll be curious to see how they evolve over time and whether or not as people you know air quotes get serious about their finances and things like that whether or not they're comfortable having all of their savings in a robin hood account as opposed to a thousand dollars that they're kind of you know just trading around or you know throwing at meme stocks or whatever so i'm certainly not saying that's all people are doing on there of course yeah i get it yeah but but stuff like crypto trading and things like that in the cash app. I, I, I don't know how much of this is really. Sure. Um, you, you get your first real job and uh, you know, you think about retire, you know, opening a retirement account because you're starting a family or something and, and you know, you're starting to take your finances more seriously uh, for whatever reason. And like, yeah, like, are you, are you, are you starting to put your, your, your monthly, your monthly savings into Robin hood or, you know, you know, which, to your point, they don't even offer IRAs, you know, uh, you know, accounts like that, which like to me is like, that's one of my biggest criticisms of like, especially Robinhood. I mean, when you're basically essentially just a brokerage, like how, you know, like it, it almost is like just a trading platform for me, you know, not really a, a true investment uh, brokerage, mm-hmm. but like, um, uh, yeah, to your point, like they don't offer some of the more robust options like that. Yeah, there's something to be said for age, definitely. And there's, there's, for any of these businesses, obviously, there's bumps along the way. And Robinhood has, has dealt with their fair, their fair share of, uh, I guess, problems would be a fair word. Um, I, as I think about the big banks, their deposit bases are, you know, for the really big banks are, you know, on the order of a trillion dollars in terms of kind of consumer small business banking deposits. Um I would continue to look at things like Ally, which is a kind of a, an online bank that has been successful in taking share, both of the kind of digital channel, but also of obviously banking generally, because digital's outgrown kind of the core deposit base. So I think there's definitely things here to watch. And I look at companies like Cash App and Square, and I, I, I just think they are well run or they appear to be well run. And they're very good at at least the customer acquisition part of the game. So to to write them off would be the equivalent of sticking my head in the sand, which is not very smart. So um, yeah, I think there's a lot of validity to what you say. Yeah, Ally is an interesting one, um, you know, because they really went after like the car loan market and just attacked it. Like it took a lot of market share and they're really trying to grow it out from there, you know, but like, it's interesting how they just attacked like a certain market segment. They have really robust digital offerings, um, you know, especially for a bank of their size, but uh it's just, it is, uh, that's actually like, you know, of, of quote unquote, like traditional banks, um, you know, but they're, they're one I've, I've looked at hard a, f- a few different times. Yeah, I took a, I took a somewhat deep look at it. I think Enlightened Capital told me to look closer and he had done good work on it and shared it with me and just sucked my thumb and it's been a great stock tone. So <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> I get yeah, what I deserve, get what I deserve on that one. Likewise. But I'm, st- I'm even though I missed it, I'm, I'm still very impressed with what they've done. They've taken a lot of deposit share. It's harder for me to get as comfortable with some of the credit type stuff only because I'm not as familiar with the bank. But I mean, that's a reality of investing in financials in any sort of way. So um, yeah, I think it. we'll see what happens with stuff like the yield curve. We'll see what happens with deposit share over time. You know, I'd be interested to see, for example, how if we actually do get a steep and yield curve, you know, deposit betas historically, even the most recent, you know, hiking cycle have held in a, a range of kind of 35 to 40%. So obviously the banks have kept a pretty significant share of the hikes that could move higher. It could become like we were talking about with airlines or other businesses like that, where volumes go down, this space could potentially get more competitive and 
if the if the differentials are big enough, maybe you'll see that a younger consumer is willing to be with the online only a bank or a, a you know what we wouldn't traditionally consider a bank because they're getting one and a half percent on their money versus twenty basis points. So we'll see how this plays out. It, it could be interesting. Sure, absolutely. Um, one last question. So, like in your in your Substack that you're launching, um, you have a quote in there from one of your introductory posts. It says, "To quote Charlie Munger." My preferred approach is patience followed by pretty aggressive conduct. I don't make portfolio changes very often, but when I do, they are meaningful decisions. So like, uh, like how do you, like, can you give us any light, uh, like how you do make portfolio allocation decisions? Yeah. So as, as you're, as people who have listened to the first, uh, the first episode we did together, and now this one will realize there's certain industries that I that I kind of like a lot, or companies that I like a lot, where I'll be kind of sniffing around for a long time. Something like a Spotify or a Dollar General, or you know, new names that I'm adding to the list. And my kind of preferred approach, once they hit a level, or when I get comfortable enough with the business that I that I'm willing to invest, I would typically look to put you know somewhere on the order of five percent. Um, and maybe more depending on, on how attractive it appears into the, into the business. I've, I've really tried to make a, a concerted effort to get away from the, you know, one, two, 3% size positions, which it works for a lot of people. It's just something that for me, it becomes, it becomes too unwieldy and it's hard for me to really stay on top. Kind of what we were talking about in March where we, you know, both things kind of slipped past just when the world really got crazy. That's how I feel when I look in a portfolio and see like, just 30 names or so I've never had that money many, but just as an example, if I had 25 positions that are a percent each, it's just hard for me to stay on top of that to the extent that I really want to. So long story short, I take relatively meaningful positions out of the gate. And then as you, as people who read the portfolio review, will see, I talk about, you know, kind of average cost and how long it's been, it's been in the book. Most of the things have been in there for a long time. The two biggest positions have been in there since 2011. A lot of other positions have been in there since, 2016, 2017. I, I find these businesses like Microsoft, Disney, Berkshire, and I really want to hold them for as long as possible. So if if that needs to be the outcome, the work before making the decision needs to be pretty, pretty stringent. So that's that's really where I think I I can make the good decision is at the first buy and then not really tinkering with it too much from thereafter. All right. All right. So let's wrap up our conversation there. Alex, where can people find your Substack if they're interested? Uh, that's a good question. I don't have the URL or anything on me, but if you go to my if you go to my Twitter page, I'll make sure to pin it once we launch this thing. Which I guess this is probably going out Tuesday, so it'll it'll be pinned by then. And he can be found on Twitter at t s o h, which stands for the Signs of Hitting underscore Investing. And he's a he's a great follow. We'll have a link to your Twitter profile in the article accompanying this episode. Um, but let's wrap it up there. Uh, science of hitting, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming on today and discussing investing topics with us. Always have uh, fun talking with you, Matt. Have a good one. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Matthew Cochran, lead advisor with Seven Investing, and we're here to empower you to invest in your future. Have a great day, everyone.